Okay, Alex, thank you very much. Thank you, Lucy, for introduction and welcome everybody. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about um, choosing the best material for your RF uh, printed circuit board designs. Um, and uh, wanna touch on a, on a couple of basics um, that hopefully are, are um, um, helping you um, being better able to um, provide your questions to, to your PCB supplier, to us as a material supplier and get what you really want at the end of the day. So starting um, with uh, material characteristics uh, showing the agenda, we talk about what's the difference between radio frequency microwave and uh, HSD, uh, high speed digital materials. Um, um, what is uh, within decay, there are a couple of uh, dependencies uh, like uh, anisotropy, frequency, temperature, and so on. Same for DF. Um, we are going to talk about insertion loss. Um, and later on, I'm going to show a couple of measurement uh, systems. Um, and then um, what we see as how requirements on RF stackups have evolved over time. And finally, a quick snapshot, um, but I'm going to keep that brief, a quick snapshot about our materials. Um, so starting with a difference between high-speed digital and RF signals, um, and um, to me, uh, basically, um, it is that in HSD, we have digital signals, mostly uh, just two levels, zeros and ones, can be more levels for pump four, pump eight, and so on, but it's a um, limited number of levels. We talk about rectangular shapes. And the frequencies are, while not low, they are still very often much lower than in RF microwave. Um, properties that um, uh, designers are concerned with is impedance, insertion loss, and something called fiber weave effect. Um, we are talking about woven glass reinforced materials. So you can imagine if your circuitry runs over a, a bundle of glass, um, it acts a little bit different than if it uh, runs in between glass fibers. Um, on the other side, in RF microwave, um, we typically talk about analog signals, continuous amplitude, sine waves. Frequencies can be much, much higher. Uh, in automotive radar, for example, we are on 77 gigahertz. Um, for um, sixth generation mobile network, uh, we will be even higher, probably uh, even above 125 gigahertz. But we talk about more narrow band frequencies, not DC to the frequency we are, we are interested in, in case of HSD. Um, and designers are foremost, in my opinion, concerned about losses, um, anisotropy of a material, but very, very important to everybody is consistency. It's not so much about the absolute value, it's about consistency. And um, um, one very common requirement is to meet a certain decay requirement, and it's not that low is always better. Uh, you need to hit the decay that the design is asking for. Um, on the right hand side, um, um, just uh, um, to um, explain why RF designers very often look at signals differently. Um, uh, HSD designers think in the time domain, which is a blue curve uh, at the top, uh, zeros and ones. And if you transfer that to a frequency domain, you get something like that, very broadband signal starting from DC out to higher frequencies. In RF microwave, we talk about sine waves. Um, which translate when in frequency domain to a very narrow frequency band. And so RF microwave designers very often um, work in a frequency domain while um, HSD designers tend to work in a time domain. But it's the same information. You can transfer back and forth. Um, it's just uh, what people are used to, to seeing. Um, the question why material selection is so important in RF designs is that um, the base material is not just the carrier for your transmission lines. Um, it, it's much, much more. It's influencing your signals. It's influencing the transmission parameters like propagation speed. Uh, it causes a phase shift. It causes losses, attenuation. Um, the metal cladding um, 
is also uh, affecting the losses. And we are going into that a little bit deeper in, in follow-up slides. But um, you can't just think of a metal as a, as a, as a flat surface. Uh, there are roughnesses involved. Uh, there is a shape of a trace involved. All of that matters. And um, particularly in RF, uh, we very often have structures that are passive elements like inductances, coils, or cap capacitance. Um, and you can form filter circuits with that. So it's not um, just a pure transmission from A to B. It's much, much more. And again, tolerances of all the parameters, dielectric thickness, decay, DF, line width, and so on. Tolerances are key. The name of a game is as few tolerances as possible. Um, now, having spoken about that there are HSD and RF requirements, uh, you will see that there are also materials that are uh, tailored for HSD and materials that are tailored for RF. And the question very often is, what's the difference? And what we on our end do is in RF that we have constructions that keep a certain decay for all of our thicknesses. On the HSD side, that's different. Uh, typically, resin content changes over thickness, which affects decay. You don't want to have that in RF microwave. So we make sure that independent of thickness, you get the same decay. There's no change of resin content. There's a reduced thickness tolerances. Again, we don't want to have too much tolerances at all. We want to reduce variation. That's why we have to do that. And then there's testing of electrical properties of dielectric constant and dissipation factor for every batch, which in turn makes the materials very stable and repeatable. Now, starting with the first um, parameter of the first char characteristics, dielectric constant, also called decay or epsilon r. Um, decay is basically the ratio of a of a capacitance of a dielectric filled uh, capacitor to an air filled capacitor. Um, uh, we all may remember the experiments in the physics class where you had a, a plate capacitor and you measured the capacitance and then you put the dielectric inside and the capacitance changed and the ratio is a decay. And uh, the decay is affecting the impedance. Uh, the impedance goes with a um, square root or rather the inverse of a square root of decay. Um, um, the decay also affects the propagation delay. Higher decay makes the signals propagate slower. Um, it increases phase shift. Um, and also the higher decay will increase the coupling between parallel uh, conductors. So decay really has an effect on how your, your circuitry works. Um, now, the name dielectric constant, unfortunately, is a misleading term. Um, it's not a constant. It's a, it's a parameter that is changing over orientation of a field. There's an anisotropy. Uh, we are talking about woven glass reinforced materials. So the C-axis property is different than in-plane properties. So you really need to uh, consider what field orientation your design has. And, and then you can check the right decay property that is either in plane or out of plane. And those are different. Uh, there's a influence of a temperature on a decay value. Uh, there for sure is a frequency dependency. And also um, all these systems, all these resin systems do show a certain degree of aging um, that affects the dielectric properties. Uh, the key here is to keep that um, very small, so there's not a lot of change over, over aging. Um, starting with anisotropy, on the right-hand side, um, I have a, a quick sketch of a um, strip line, an inner layer strip line. You have two reference grounds, top and bottom, and the trace in the center. And what you can see here in gray is the woven glass reinforcement. You have glass bundles going from right, left to right, and you have glass bundles going into the plane of, 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 of a monitor. Um, and that material, that glass, has a higher decay than the surrounding resin. The resin, I have just here pointed out, the resin um, 
there is also uh, in a, a lot of resin systems where is a, a filler involved, a filler particles. But for the purpose of explaining my anisotropy, we can consider the filler particles as part of a resin. So the resin and filler matrix has a certain decay. The glass has a different, a higher decay. So in, in, in effect, if you have your E-field going perpendicular to the surface, you see more of a resin, less of a glass. But if you would have an E-field going left to right, you would pick up more of glass. So you would get a higher decay. And you see that in the histogram here on the left. Uh, that's the same material that was tested in blue. It was tested with a um, out of plane test method, uh, electrical field perpendicular to the to the um, surface, and the reddish one is the in plane. And you can clearly see the in plane decay is higher than the out of plane decay. And that's just a consequence of the use of a woven glass reinforcement in the material. Um, if you look on decay over frequency, um, you will see that the decay is dropping. Um, but um, what's important here, I have put a, 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 a double-sided arrow on the left-hand side showing a range of plus minus 0.05, which is the typical decay tolerance that we offer. So you can see that for the, mat for the material shown here, the change over frequency is smaller, much smaller than uh, allowed tolerance. So it's not a big issue for that particular material. But still, it needs to be kept in mind. Uh, it's not a, um, um, a constant, but there is a variation over frequency. Um, if we look at the decay over temperature, pretty much a similar story. We have a change of decay over temperature, decay increasing here with, te with temperature. Um, but again, compared to the overall spec, it's not a big deal. Um, and we don't have to worry too much about it, um, at least not for the temperature range that we show here. Um, even if we would extend to 130 degree centigrade, 140 degree centigrade, um, it would not change the picture very much. You would see a, a very small slope of a decay. Um, but if you have very critical designs, you may need to consider that. Um, here is a, a experiment where we put the material in the oven at an elevated temperature for a thousand hours, uh, quite a long time. And we tested decay um, as received and after the testing. And the good news here is that the free materials that we, we offer in that range, they show a rather small change. So the resin formulation was done in a way that those materials are very um, um, stable over aging, so it doesn't need to be a concern. Switching gears from dilate constant to dissipation factor. Uh, there are a lot of names for dissipation factor, DF, tangens delta, loss tension, dilate loss factor. It's all the same. It's the, the, the parameter that describes how much how much dielectric losses our, our material has. And again, we have an influence from a glass reinforcement. We have an anisotropy in plane and out of plane. DF will look different. There will be influence of temperature. There will be influence of frequency and also of aging. Um, and and um, just to show you rather quickly, um, again, similar charts than before. Blue was out of plane DF, red is in plane DF, you see a small shift in absolute value. Um, you see here upper right hand side how DF increases with frequency. Um, lower left, you see how DF is increasing with temperature. And again, um, how the aging affects the DF. And again, the story is very similar as for decay. Um, for the materials we, we are showing here, the changes are not. Um, that large, so we have very stable materials in that case. At the end of the day, um, DF is a is a um, let's say a, um, um, a first factor. But what designers are really looking into is insertion loss. How much attenuation do I get over my transmission line? Um, that's the important question, and 
Um, we very often receive a question, how much losses uh, is one of your materials Isola creating? And the answer is always the same. Um, we can't answer that directly because insertion loss is not purely a material property. Yes, there's an influence of the dielectric properties like decay in the F. There is an impact of uh, uh, conductor properties like conductivity and treatment roughness. But there are also parameters that are outside of our control. There's the design impact. Line width for sure has an impact on, on insertion loss. The choice of a dielectric thickness uh, is having a, an impact on, on, on losses. And um, very clearly, uh, a longer transmission line will have a higher loss than a short transmission line. So that's a factor as well. And then there's the processing, the manufacturing of a PCB. There are all kinds of um, um, uh, surface preparation steps, um, um, pre-cleaning steps, alternative oxide steps that change the roughness of a copper foil. Um, that's having an effect on the total insertion loss. If we talk about outer layer um, transmission lines, there's a metal surface finish put on a board. Um, that surface finish can also change the uh, insertion loss properties. So um, the total insertion loss can only be discussed once the whole design and, and the PCB processing is defined. Um, but looking purely in the dielectric um, material properties, I have a chart here on the right hand side, where you can see several material classes, insertion loss over frequency. And you can see um, there are two materials in, in the bluish colors that are higher loss um, and the um, three materials at, at, at the top end, which are much lower loss. Um, so there are choices of loss, um, let's say categories. Um, you can go to a very high end, you can get to a not as high end, uh, which uh, of course has an effect on, on the overall cost. Um, some designs may wanna uh, um, get away with as low cost material as possible. So it really depends on what your design needs. Um, Alex, there's some questions which I think you can answer yeah. live. Yeah. Uh, so one question was about mechanical strength you were talking about. Uh, it does, what does that mean? Does that mean in terms of mechanical strength that the dielectric is going to crack sooner or show more signs of wear? No, what, what, what we typically talk about is, uh, at least in rigid boards, um, there is something uh, called the uh, coefficient of thermal expansion. So if you change the temperature, the material will um, increase in size and, and contract uh, after that, um, if you cool down again. And if you have um, um, dielectric on one hand side and the copper um, in through holes, uh, micro VS and so on, um, it's important to make sure that those two types of materials don't uh, vary too much. Uh, otherwise, you get stresses between the copper and the dielectric if you change the temperature in your design. So that's an important consideration, uh, which at the end of the day impacts the um, uh, reliability of a product. Um, beside that, I would say in rigid boards, no, it's it's not really an issue. Uh, if we would talk about flexible circuits, that's a different story where you need to be able to bend the dielectric multiple times without fractures. Uh, but as we are offering um, purely rigid materials, uh, that's not something we need to worry about. So, uh, and then there's the question of whether more resin, you know, makes it less susceptible to cracking. I think, uh, can I answer this one a little bit? Like yeah, sure. what, when you're, when you're drilling a board, um, you know, you have, and especially if it's aerospace or there's a wicking requirement, when you drill the board, some materials act differently. And yes, you do have more like fracturing. And so, but that is not as, I mean, I think that you have to, you know, tr test basically, you know, based on the hole size, the drill, the materials, 
you know, what yeah. does the wicking end up being, you know, based on these fractures? So I think yeah, that... And is... I think that that's actually a, a, a balancing act. On one hand side, you mm -hmm. want to have a relatively hard surface for many boards. Um, on the other hand side, um, a soft material would be less prone to cracking. Um, at the end of the day, I think um, what we have seen um, with uh, with production of boards, and, and, and I spent uh, quite a while in at a PCB manufacturer myself, um, choosing the right tools, the right geometry of the drilling tools, choosing the right drilling parameters, optimizing the desmering properties, that's really key. I would say with the materials uh, that we offer to the market, um, they are quite easy to handle from a PCB manufacturing process, including the drilling and desmering. So I would say it's 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 perfectly possible to get a, a good set of, of parameters that should keep the wicking and, and things like that in check. Absolutely. And there's a few more questions. I know it's uh I think it's important to answer them uh, at this stage, but one question was um, the DK and DF values that you're talking about, do, the, do those vary across the sheet in XY? Yeah, you, 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 you have a certain um, tolerance, of course, in manufacturing. We are talking about um, rather large size um, uh, machines. Uh, typically in the laminate industry, you work with a 50 inch, five zero inch wide roll. Um, so you have a quite an area to cover. Um, and um, of, of course, no process is without variation. So you have to expect, if you go over a full manufacturing sheet, that you have um, 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 little um, variations. On the other hand side, that's one of our um, key requirements to our manufacturing folks that we need to keep these tolerances as small as possible. Um, what, what we see is that for most applications that that's not an, a, a, a really a big issue. Um, and if you really get to a design that's extremely sensitive, then our recommendation would be to keep a little bit a larger manufacturing frame PCB shops need a manufacturing border around the, the, the actual, actual usable image anyway. So um, if you are very sensitive, uh, keep a little bit more um, uh, clearance to the, to the edge of your, your manufacturing panel and, and that should help a, a big deal. Okay, thanks. I think that covers uh, like what's um, relevant right now. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Amit. Okay, um, switching gears from dielectric to copper. Um, and um, I mentioned uh, in an earlier slide that the roughness of a, of a copper will have an effect. And just showing here, um, left column, one type of material, and um, um, right-hand side uh, of our pictures, uh, uh, typical ceramic filled PTFE. And what you can see here is the roughness of the copper. Uh, the material on the left-hand side has a very smooth interface from a trace to the dielectric, while with the ceramic filled PTFE, there's a lot of more roughness. Um, and you see that also in, in the not as highly magnified uh, cross sections down here. And um, I'm going to tell you that roughness is really making uh, insertion losses a lot higher. And so you don't have to just take my word. Uh, I'm also having an a actual measurement chart on the right-hand side. You see here um, in different colors, different roughness copper faults, and you see insertion loss over frequency as typical with S21 plots, um, the zero line here at the top would mean no attenuation at all. And the more you go down, towards, the more losses you get. And so you can easily see the red curve, which happens to be the most smooth copper fall, is having the lowest uh, insertion losses. And if you go to that purple one at the bottom, that is the one with the highest roughness, and it's having the, the highest insertion loss. Um, I'm not claiming that there's a di direct relationship between RC and losses. There are more factors to it, 
But overall, the, the takeaway here is the more roughness you see, you are going to see more, more, more losses. So uh, you really want to have as smooth a, a metallic surface as possible. Um, there is a part of as received copper roughness. And in that cross section here on the right hand side, um, down here where my cursor is, that's the dielectric, that's the laminate. Um, and the interface between the copper and, and, and the laminate, that's what we ship out to our customers. That's not going to change over processing. And you see a certain uh, roughness here. And that roughness can change depending on what copper fall you specify. But you can see there's also roughness on the other three sides. Those three sides uh, started off as smooth, very smooth surface areas. What you see here is the impact of um, the processing in the PCB um, uh, uh, manufacturing. Um, um, it's a necessary process. Um, the PCB shops need to roughen up the surface to get good adhesion to the next dielectric that comes uh, on top of that. So it's not that this is done just to, to make things worse. There's a, there's a good reason for doing that. But that roughness is also creating an effect. And left-hand side, a small ANOVA chart. Um, I have done a couple of measurements uh, um, um, where I changed in the top chart the copper fall type from a very smooth ultra low profile copper fall to a similar roughness copper fall to a regular VLP to an RTF type of fall. And what you can see is that the losses for the ultra low profile fall are the lowest and for the RTF, uh, in that case, they are the highest. The bottom chart is showing the impact of the oxide replacement. So both three sides in the picture to the right, a standard oxide replacement having higher losses and the oxide replacement it is not putting as much roughness on the surface um, um, is creating not as much losses. So there's an impact from both the copper fall you define, uh, that's that part here, but there's also an impact from the processes that the copper fall is subjected to. Um, so both need to be um, considered in any simulation work. Finally, insertion um, um, surface finishes. If we talk about a surface microstrip that is not covered by solder mask, uh, where the surface finish is deposited directly on the traces, there is an impact of, of the surface finish on, on the insertion loss. And you see here six types of um, surface finishes. The main takeaway here is, uh, I saw it in the poll at the beginning, ENIG is still the most popular finish, um, and I understand why that is. It's just a very uh, convenient surface finish. Uh, it's very uh, stable. Um, you can you can touch it. It doesn't change. You can clean it very easily. It's a very very nice finish. The downside is the nickel in the ENIG is creating additional losses at high frequencies, and that's why that ENIG curve here is the highest of the losses of the finishes. On the other hand side, if you go to the blue curve here, immersion silver, um, it has a much, much better insertion loss characteristics because there's no nickel involved. But on the downside, um, this finish is so much more sensitive. Um, it's not as easy to handle. So again, this is a balancing act. Um, I'm not saying that one finish is the best or the other one is the worst. What I'm saying is, if you are very much driven by insertion losses, you may need to go to finishes like the blue one. On the other hand side, if the losses are not so much your concern and you need more a finish that is um, uh, easy to handle, then ENIG may be the right one for you. So again, you, you need to understand what the impacts are and then you can do a, a, a good decision. Okay, next topic, measurements. Uh, going quickly through it, um, two very common methods to measure in, 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 in uh, PCBs are either time domain-based measurements, um, TDR, or VNA, which are frequency uh, domain um, um, 
based measurements. And the other important part is we have been talking about decay in DF. So of course, how you measure decay in DF is an important uh, consideration. TDR is basically sending a voltage step down the transmission line. It could also be just a pulse, not, not, not a step. Um, and when you look at the signal over time, you look at it reflective. So you just send it into the, the same pins coupon and you look at the reflections, that's TDR, R for reflection, or you um, 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 put, uh, your launch the signal on one end and you look at the receiving signal at a far end, that would be TDT, um, time domain transmission. Um, and those two types can help with um, measuring attenuation, propagation delay, and impedance. And uh, down here, you see a, a very typical um, impedance chart over, over time, over distance, uh, the launch on the left-hand side, and when you have an actual trace, and when you hit the end of a trace, it goes to infinity. Um, that's what you look at. Um, two tools shown here, um, um, more simple tool that is used a lot in PCB manufacturing process because it's uh, it's very um, 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 stable against being damaged by ESD um, or a tool that's more for the lab environment has more capabilities but is uh, very easy to damage um, so um, there are multiple options but at the end of the day you will get a TDR curve like that and what's important here is that those curves can look very different. The left one, I consider very well behaved. You can see the impedance is very flat going from left to right beside the launch here and, and the end of the trace going here. But sometimes it look, looks like that. So you have a significant increase of impedance over, over distance over time. And, and what that means is you need to be clear if you talk about impedance with a TDR, that unless you specify how far, how far out you are going to measure, um, the result may be a bit different. The other takeaway here is those are time domain based uh, measurements. Um, we quite often receive a question, um, can we measure impedance with a TDR at a frequency of one gigahertz, five gigahertz, 10 gigahertz, whatever the number is, um, that's not possible. TDR is a, um, a mixture from DC to higher frequencies. So you have a, um, um, a bunch of frequency involved. Uh, the question about what frequency uh, we are measuring or defining what frequency you wanna, wanna have a measurement be performed at, that's not possible with TDR. Um, on the plus side, you can, see how the impedance changes over distance. If you need to talk about um, impedance or properties over frequency, then you need to work with a VNA, Vector Network Analyzer, where you put sine waves of a certain frequency into the device. Um, the device is depicted here in the center. You send a signal in, you get a reflection um, back uh, to the beginning, or you send in a signal and you receive a, a, a transmission at a far end, and the same from a, from a backside reflection here and transmission from back to front. And those four parameters, S11 through S22, are the results you typically get with a, with a VNA. Um, you get a lot of more information than with a TDR, but it can be very quickly uh, demanding to operate and understand. Um, so um, I would say, um, this is more a tool for the lab. Um, you will not see that very often being uh, used um, on the shop floor of a manufacturing site. Um, but um, if you need to um, dig deeper into details, then you will no need to use a VNA. And there was, um, sorry, there yeah. was a question. There was a question. What is ISIG? Not on this slide, but it was a a lot of slides back. Uh, so has finished. Yeah. Was it I I ISIG is immersion silver immersion gold. Um, the green one here. Um, that has been um uh, a finish that was uh, um 
promoted in the industry for a while um, in trying to be more stable than immersion silver and with similar loss characteristics. Downside is um, the one subcontractor that I know that was offering it, they pulled it from a market. There was not enough requ not enough uh, requests from, from a customer base to really uh, uh, keep that process running. So it's it, it could have been a nice finish, but the industry has not endorsed it. So for now, it's uh, it's not really available. So I can I can make a comment. I mean, Enig is obviously better for shelf life, but as you can see, is not the best for an RF or high speed type of situation. Um, if it's if you choose immersion silver, then you just have to specify packaging notes properly, like vacuum seal the circuit boards, you know, make sure there's no um, moisture, you know, those types of things, and then the immersion silver can last a little longer. So. Yeah, that, that 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 that's a good comment, Amit. Um, as 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 I, I I mentioned, it's a it's a decision making process which way to go, and both sides have their pros and cons. Um, so it's it's really too important. It's really important to understand the consequences. I had shown the electrical um, um consequences. You were talking about the shelf life and 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 handling limitations. So yeah. Um, my there's another there's another is... consequence actually, which is that for these smoother surface finishes, those are actually better for the fine pitch components yeah. when you're doing assembly. Yeah. And my recommendation really is talk to your PCP supplier, um, um, discuss with them your project, your requirements, and they will be able to give you a helping hand in picking a good surface finish. Um, that's not only in regards to surface finish, that's an overall comment. The earlier you talk with your manufacturer, the, the better. So I can really um, 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 put that out as a most important learning of 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 uh, you, you can you can can take away. And talk with and your supplier. And you and, know what's uh, interesting is that most you know most in the past that we haven't really even inquired about you know what kind of speeds. Um, the, the you know the board is going to be you know used for but i think you know as we mature as as a supplier we're starting to ask more and give feedback on the rf side of things yeah um but yeah it's usually not on any fab drawing or anything it just comes it becomes apparent when the material chosen is a little bit better uh and there's another question uh what is the effect of conformal coating on surface traces I don't, yeah. I don't know where that's coming from, but yeah. So so typically the, the material used in conformal coating um, is tailored to um, protect the circuit. It's at least up to now not really tailored to uh, providing best electrical char characteristics. Um, and the same thing would be actually true for solder masks. Um, um, until basically now. Um, most solder mask types are not really very good dielectric materials. So the, the short answer really is conformal coating while protecting the circuitry from environmental influences, it will hurt the electrical properties. It will increase the losses. It will increase the decay. Decay is not so much an issue because you can um, modify your design to accommodate for that, but you will see higher losses. Okay, great. And then there's a question about how moisture affects DK and DF. Yeah. So um, if if you look at it, um, uh, water vapor has a rather high decay. So if you get water vapor into your dielectric, it will increase the decay and it will also increase the losses. The question now becomes how much humidity can you get in an actual board? Um, if we talk about inner layers and you have reference planes on both sides, um, the humidity really can only um, get into the board from a from a side walls, from a from a routing edges of 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 your PCB. So unless you are talking about being consistently at a high humidity, uh, I would be very hard pressed to see a lot of humidity getting into the board. If we talk about a surface microstrip, that's a little bit different story. 
where you have more surface area, a shorter distance to where it really matters, where you could get the uh, um, 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 humidity into the material, changing the properties, increasing uh, losses. Um, that would then become um, a point if you have to work in a uh, high humidity environment where things like conformal coding may actually be a good choice. Is that answering the question? Yeah, I think so. There's another one, which is, you know, immersion gold is usually done after solder mass. Yeah. So, so the question is, like, how does that take into account? Because is it the insertion loss for the entire copper surface or the immersion gold, which is only on pads? Yeah. So so what, what, what we have here is, again, uh, dependency on a design. If you would have um, a solder mask over bare copper, um, SMOBC um, type of designs, um, you would not need to worry about the impact of uh, surface finish on uh, transmission line properties because there is no surface finish on, on the traces. There are solder mask on the traces. The issue is that solder mask is a poor dielectric. So the moment uh, losses are of a concern to you, you can't really um, accept solder mask in the trace. So you will um, um, do a, um, a clearance of a solder mask over all your critical traces, which in turn means all of these surface finishes are going to be deposited on the traces. And now the chart that I'm showing here is again applying um, the surface finish is going to change the losses if you go to higher frequencies. Okay. okay, I think that covers me, most of the questions right now. Okay, um, um, jumping back to um, um, PKDF testing methods, and I'm, I'm, I'm going over that only rather briefly. What I wanted to show here is even within the IPC TM650 test manual, there's a large number of DKDF testing methods. Um, they have different field orientations. And remember what I was speaking about, anisotropy very early in the presentation. We have different frequency ranges, all kind of different ways in measuring. So you will get different decay DF values depending on the method. So now if you start comparing data sheets between different materials, um, the important takeaway is you need to make sure that you understand what method was used and you can actually only compare the values if you are talking about the same method. If you have different methods and different data sheets, you unfortunately cannot really directly compare the values stated there. And, and then you need to go the next step and see if you can get a data set um, that is the same method for both materials, or you actually need to do testing yourself. Um, that's unfortunately, uh, IPC has allowed uh, too many methods to, to, to get into the, the test manual over time. Um, you can see some of them are rather old um, from 85, even 75, uh, many, many years back, but they are still all um, um, available test methods. And beside IPC indoor test methods, there are even more test methods. So the picture gets rather complicated. Okay. Um, jumping to the change in requirements. Um, what we had is for a long, long time, we had something like what I'm showing here on the upper left-hand side. In the red, we had one RF material and everything else was pretty much FO4, standard FO4, high DG FO4. Um, you had a reference ground in layer two and the signals in layer one. So it was a rather simple stack up. You could just buy an RF core and put it on top of something else. But things have changed. Um, requirements for circuitry uh, has evolved. And what we are starting to see is that um, RF designers want to have not only one tool, but three or even more um, layers, copper layers that are using RF dielectric. So now you start to need to get an RF prepreg. And that's something where um, we really started the game um, um, 
in earlier days, there were only RF laminates. Um, now we have RF laminates and prepreg. So you can do more than one RF layer. And if you go to the extreme, you can even go to something like HDAI, uh, high density interconnect, any layer type of constructions where you have micro VS just between two adjacent couple layers. And you can either stack all those micro VRs, or as in the cross section here, you can stack those micro VRs on top of each other. What that requires is every single dielectric here beside the center one is going to be a prepreg. So uh, you can't do that with classic RF laminates. You need RF prepregs. Um, that's a requirement that we have seen um, um, being introduced in the industry, and we see that more and more. Um, what it also means. You need to be able to laminate with prepregs rather easily. Um, so again, um, um, the folks at Sierra, they need to be able to to handle those prepregs, do the lamination process in a in a in, in a good way. So the, the, um, the ease of processing of a material gets really key. Um, dimensional stability. If you put multiple micro VS on top of each other, you really need to make sure that the underlying layer is where you expect it to be, so it needs to be stable. If you do a lot of drilling, obviously, you need to be able to drill easily. And after the drilling, there's a plating, so that's another requirement. It needs to be easy to plate. Um, if you have a dielectric that's pretty much non-stick, um, that's very difficult to plate. So. Both are requirements that um, we need in more um, um, advanced RF designs. And um, this is not just sketches that I'm showing here. Uh, um, I'm going to show you in, in, in just uh, one slide be, or two slides beyond that, some actual designs where we use that. Just talking quickly about lamination. Um, we really need two prepregs, same material for a prepreg than, than, than the core. When we have freedom of design, it needs to be able to fill embedded structures well, um, short lamination cycle, no extreme parameters in the lamination. You want to be able to mix and match materials. And I'm I'm trying to illustrate that it should be as easy of stack, like stacking Lego bricks on top of each other. That's what we want. And that's what we, we, are, we are trying to provide with our materials. Drilling, uh, an actual example here, you see, that many, many, many vias along the trace, uh, the fencing vias. So in RF designs, you have a large number of drills. Um, so drilling needs to be easy, otherwise it gets really, really, really um, costly. Ceramic fillers are not a good idea um, to, to help with the drilling. So um, um, we decided on using soft filler particles, which makes the drilling much more, more easy. Um, we also have uh, Steve Carney here, if, if he wants to comment on, you know, the drilling challenges of different RF materials. Um, he pretty much covered it. Um, the biggest issue is uh, when you get into ceramic fillers, um, the, um, give you an example, typically you can get maybe a thousand hits off of a drill bit. Um, when you add ceramic, now you're down to 200. Mm -hmm. um, this uh, makes it time consuming and costly because not only are you burning through drills, but you're taking a lot longer because now you're essentially, the drill machine is spending as much time changing the drill as it is actually drilling holes. So um, it definitely gets difficult. Um, the um, the soft uh, PTFE materials, uh, they do take special handling as far as um, being supported. Um, there are other issues throughout the shop, mainly handling. Um, the PTFE materials are um, much more fragile than the um, than the FR4 based high speed materials. So yeah, soft filler particles um, does help quite a bit. Okay, great, thanks. Thanks for the comments, appreciate it. Um, okay, um, I'm going to jump over, over the, the tolerance chart here and going right into actual 
examples. Um, here you can see uh, actual board. There's a first lamination step here. Then there's a second lamination step here of a buried board. There's a second bo buried board here. And those two buried boards are put together in that step here. And then there's a final lamination step. You, you can see this is a very complicated board. Um, and that's all RF material. So try to do something like that in PTFE. Um, <laughs> I'm going to bet uh, that will be extremely difficult to impossible. Um, so um, those new type of materials are really a necessity to allow for the advancements in designs. Um, here's another one um, with any layer design. Uh, we see that in, in some circuits that because of components put on, 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 on top of a board, BGA type of components, very um, dense um, uh, grids, uh, you can't really service them with so wires anymore. You need to use micro vias, even stacked micro vias um, to get the routing density and doing that in combination with uh, RF signal, you need an RF material. Um, and, and, and that's again, a change from what we had in, um, in um, RF circuits many years back. Okay. Um, very quick material snapshot as 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 a final uh, slide from 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 my end. Uh, apologies that uh, I had to rush a little bit, um, but uh, um, obviously a lot of material to cover. Um, so what I want to show here is that we as a solar offer a large range of materials. We have here in the center portion. Um, RF centric materials, materials that are very good to use in the RF microwave range. We have other materials that we consider HSD materials, materials for high speed digital boards. If you look through that, you will see some materials being on both sides of a fence. It's not really a fence, uh, it's just a, um, um, a dis distinguishing between the materials. Those are the same material uh, characteristics. Um, at the bottom, but we have selected here certain constructions that allow to get a, a decay of say a 338, which is an industry standard. While on the HSD side, designers typically want all the, um, the choices they can think of. So here you have a lot of choices, but you need to make sure that you consider the right decay. While in RF microwave, you typically have only one choice, uh, makes it easier to not uh, have somebody use the wrong material, but then you are more limited to design in your design. But as we offer both types, uh, you can kind of uh, jump back and forth, mix and match, um, whatever you need. Um, there are materials from a lower end that are for very cost sensitive solutions up to a very high end, even 77 gigahertz automotive radar type of designs. Um, that's all possible. Um, and um, I don't wanna wanna take away too much time in touting our materials. Um, I'm I'm pretty sure if you talk to Sierra, they, they can can help you with 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 uh, the first level of information. And uh, we are for sure available for more detailed um, um, information about our materials if needed. Um, there are um, some slides summarizing what what two of these materials are offering. I'm going to jump over that. Um, I think, um, um, Amit, uh, you wanted to show a quick demo of one of your tools. So um, I want to leave at least a couple of minutes for that. Apologies that I overrun. Yeah, thank you so much, Alex. Uh, Vandana, you can share your screen and start the demo. So this is going to be a demo of, uh, of our material selector tool. Yes, thank you, Lucy. Yes. Uh, so we present the material selector tool that allows you to search and filter out the rigid and flex materials from the database that best suits your design needs, right? So if you load the tool and scroll down without selecting any of the criteria here, the tool lists out all the available rigid materials in the database. Uh, there are various criteria for material selection. Uh, the first being the material type here. You can select for flex materials or the rigid materials. Uh, you can click on yes for a halogen free material or on all if you want halogen based motifs as well. Uh, you can click on this third option if you're looking specifically for very high thermal conductivity uh, materials, right? Uh, so you, you, you can also filter out the materials based on the electrical properties. Uh, 
here the materials have been categorized into four types depending on their speed and loss. You can select the category from the drop down list if the operating range of the board is known. Uh, so, for example, if you have a RF board, you could go with maybe high speed, low loss, or very high speed, very low loss category as well. Or another option is to enter either the maximum signal frequency content or the fastest signal rise time or the highest data transfer rate here. For example, let's go with 20 gigahertz and click outside over here. And we can see that the fastest signal rise time and highest data transfer rate have been calculated automatically. Uh, similarly, we have the dielectric constant, dissipation factor, dielectric electrical strength, and the dropdown for CTI class as well. Here you can use the sliders here to select the range that you desire. Under thermal properties, we have glass transition temperature, decomposition temperature, coefficient of thermal expansion in the xy axis or the z axis, and the thermal conductivity, of course. Uh, under chemical properties, we have moisture absorption, an option to uh, choose whether, you know, if you want calf resistant materials or not. Under mechanical properties, there is tensile modulus, tensile strength, and the flexoidal strength. Uh, another important category here is the family name. Sorry, family name. Uh, so for RF materials, you could either go for maybe hydrocarbon PP, Teflon, Teflon ceramic, you know. Uh, and of course, you can choose a material manufacturer as well. Let's go with Isola for now. Uh, you can also uh, enter you know, the IPC number or the slash number as well using the drop downs given here. Uh, click on go and submit. You will see that the materials that are listed in the database will be displayed over here. You can click on this view button for a detailed data sheet of the material. Uh, in this data sheet, Sorry about this, there's a glitch of some sort. All right. So when you click on this view button here, you see that there is a detailed data sheet of the material. Uh, and there is also a column which, you know, basically tells if the material is HDI preferred or not. Uh, you can also click on this compare uh, tick boxes over here and click on compare button and a side to side comparison of the you know chosen materials will be shown you could also change the unit selected from imperial to metric thank you very much thank you so much vandana uh, before we start the q and a can you please just very quickly let me know uh, which type of webinar you would like us to do next Okay, so we could do a webinar on RF PCB fabrication challenges, DFM rules for RF PCB design, or bomb management and component procurement. Okay. <laughs> well, it looks like it's going to be a tie before uh, between RF PCB fabrication challenges and DFM rules. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, okay, we can start with the Q&A. Um, Alex, can you see the questions in the Q&A section? Um, yeah, let me, yeah. Okay, um, not sure which previous slide um, uh, the first question was about. Um, um, it's asking about a frequency scale um, in gigahertz. Um, so I'm assuming that was the, the insertion loss chart. Um, that would be um, gigahertz, not hertz, um, very, very clearly. We are talking about high frequency signals. So basically everything will be gigahertz that was shown today. I think we had the question about mechanical strengths. Um, oh yeah, CBC material. Yeah, sure. You can you you could uh, combine a CPC material with RF materials. Um, please remember the Lego bricks picture that I had shown. Um, what we try is to have materials that can be combined um, in between 
each other. But of course, we understand there are also materials that are outside of what we do offer. Um, that could be CBC materials or that could be a flex material for a flex rigid board combination. Um, we try to have our materials being easy to handle so you can do all of these combinations. So from a, uh, let's say, processing point of view, um, that that's uh, that that's not not uh, that difficult to do. Uh, what needs to be said is, if you are also requiring UL approval of your of your board, um, whenever you do hybrid designs, when you mix materials and you mix too many materials, when getting UL starts to get rather time consuming and and uh, and costly. Great, thank you. Next, we have a question. Is there ISOLA document addressing mechanical stress test? Um, yeah, we, what, what we have is we have tested um, uh, quite a number of materials and material combinations for reliability with um, either OM testing or HUD testing or IST testing. So we had been looking into the um, um, let's say, um, how well different materials work together so that there are not too many, many uh, uh, mechanical stresses. Okay. Uh, can ZBC material be used with RF? Yeah, that was what I just answered in, in, in a question before. Lucy. Oh, sorry, yes. Yeah. Okay. How can I get metal parameters for all hurry for a given board? Yeah, uh, you, you you can reach out 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 to me uh, in the slide deck, and and Lucy, I believe you will pro, uh, um, distribute the slide deck uh, after the meeting. Um, yeah, there's my email address in in there. So if you reach out to me, I can provide um, um, simulation parameters for the couple of them. Great. Um, have you investigated the impact of the signal launch mismatch on your data? Yeah. So. If we talk about insertion loss, we normally use um, 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 a, um, derivation of delta L methodology. So you have um, a set of traces that is identical in every aspect beside the length. And, and if you get the full S parameters of a short trace and a long trace, then you can mathematically de-embed um, um, the, the difference in length. So at the end of the day, you're cutting away the launch on left and right in your uh, resulting data set. Right. Um, may we see the insertion loss versus finish curve from zero to 40 gigahertz? Unfortunately, I cannot share that uh, for, for that experiment. The reason was uh, the, the, the lab that was testing um, those insertion loss curves in that uh, surface finish experiment, we had uh, used a banded frequency extender, which was just going from 55 to 95 gigahertz. So no um, data below 55 gigahertz was, was captured, unfortunately. Okay, but so what you will see is that all these curves should meet um, at, uh, at DC at the same point. So you will have um, a reduction of difference between the surface finishes the lower the frequency scale. Okay, so does that answer the follow-up question by Jake, which is, can you explain if the separation is still evident? Yeah, and 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 and, and that's what, what what I just mentioned. If you go low enough, you will see no separation. Okay, sounds good. Um, is EPAG recommended? I'm not sure if you know. Um, yeah, so so uh, in all these different finishes, um, a lot of different finishes have, have been pr proposed um, to deal with a number of, of issues, um, started with um, um, reliability issues, with old style uh, uh, ENIG uh, surface finishes with, with large BGAs, to the impact of nickel on insertion loss, to um, um, handling costs and whatnot. So EPIC, um, um, uh, Electrolysis Palladium Immersion Gold, is one of these many finishes. Uh, as the name indicates, there's no nickel involved. Um, I think the main 
um, um, question really is, um, can you get it? Um, if you select a, 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 a certain PCB supplier, um, there is um, not every finish is, is available everywhere. So you may end up at a point where um, PCB shop that can handle your design overall is not having access to a particular surface finish. Another shop that may have that, that surface finish may not be able to handle the rest of your design. So again, I'm coming back to my recommendation. Talk to your PCB supplier, uh, ask them for a recommendation, and that will allow for the um, fastest way forward. Thank you. Does DK and DF significantly affect uh, GNSS signals in the range of 1.5 gigahertz? Um, as soon as we talk about um, um, traces that are not covered by solar mask and uh, 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 about immersion finishes, so not electroplated finishes, you will have the plating not only on the top of the trace, but also on the side walls. So if you have um, edge coupled traces like a, 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 a coplanar strip line or differential signals, you will have fields going through that surface finish when you will have an impact. Now, the limitation of saying at 1.5 gigahertz, I would say that's still reasonably low frequency. Um, the impact of a surface finish is probably not too big at both frequencies. It's more, um, more an issue once you get uh, above 20 or 30 gigahertz. Okay. Are the shelf life of high speed materials such as MT77 or MT40 the same as FR4? Yeah, we we um we certificate to the same IPC 4101 or 4103 um shelf life is which are um 90 days or 180 days depending on storage condition. Um so the same as you would get for FR4. Reality is that both newer materials from our side are even easier, so they are less prone to aging, um, but um, the certification, the actual certification will be the same as for an FO4, which is a 90 and the 180 days. Right. Can you recap why immersion silver has a lower insertion loss than OSP? Um, immersion silver has a slightly, in that experiment had a slightly smaller insertion loss than OSP. Now, um, I have not shown um, the variation between the multiple samples. If you see the full range of measurements for immersion silver and the full range of the measurements for OSP, you will see a big overlap. So statistically, I would be hard pressed to say one is better than the other. Great. Can you provide material libraries for HFSS or CST? Ah, good question. Very good question. Um, we don't. And let me explain quickly why. Um, um, those tools typically consider a dielectric by name. Um, now, we are talking about glass reinforced materials. So the actual construction is taking uh, a, a big impact. If you choose a core with a low resin content, it will have a higher decay. If you choose a core with a higher resin content, you will get a lower decay. And those databases, as long as they are not able to give you a choice on what actual construction you are using, they may be very dangerous, misleading. So the next best thing we can do is, uh, again, if you reach out to us, we will try to provide the data you need for a particular construction. But in general, no, we don't have both materials in um, both 3D simulation systems in the database. What is the best way to select components for signal integrity issues? Um, a bit outside of my 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 main main um, area of of expertise, but um, the more direct you can put your your silicon on your board, the less packaging you have, the smaller the packaging is, the less impact uh, regarding signal integrity. 
What is the relative fabrication cost difference between ceramic filler material and standard material? I would probably have that to 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 hand over to Amit. Um, but just as a overall um, um, statement, we had the, uh, early on um, the, the, um, the information about how many hits you can get with a drill bit on in a soft material, not using hard ceramic fills, and how much that drops um, to um, 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 when you use ceramic fillers, and that has the impact of using more drill bits and the longer time frame. So um, there is a, a significant impact, but how much? I, I would say, Amit, maybe you can speak about that. Yeah, I would have to defer that for answering that question later. You know, after I gather some information. Sounds good. Okay, two more questions. Um, I use iTerra MT40 cores on the outside on current designs. I will need to use fine PGBGAs soon. What pregs would you suggest to use for yes, so they want to get on top of human So this is what I think. Yeah, uh, um, another very good question. And I'm very happy um, um, to, um, to provide an answer to that, that in our case, we do have actual prepregs. So say with ITER MT40, you do have a prepreg that is the same resin type and the same glass composition, same with Astra MT77. So the quick answer is use the prepreg that belongs to the same resin system than the core, and you will end up with a, um, as homogeneous as possible dielectric that will allow for all these HDI uh, type of, of uh, stack-ups. And final question, do you perform calf resistivity tests on your materials using fine PGBGAs? That might be a question for us. Yeah, so so the, the, the first answer is um, we do calf testing on our materials. There are many different designs, uh, including different pitches, uh, different voltages, uh, humidities, um, temperatures, and so on. So um, I would have to check what we really have. But we do have uh, some CAF data um, for, for, for the Astra MT77. We have a lot of CAF data for the ITER MT40. Um, again, the, the um, um, idea would be if you can reach, to, uh, us, reach out to us, we can look into what meets your requirements best. Great, thank you so much. My God, that was a lot of questions. <laughs> yeah, that was thank great. You. Thanks a lot for that. <laughs> yeah, uh, thank you everyone for attending. Thank you so much, Amit, Steve, Vandana for your inputs and uh, Alex for doing this webinar with us. Thank you for giving me the opportunity.